This is a Will Clayton Church of Christ in Alma, Texas. This is June 11, 2023. Sunday evening message. Such like things do ye. Such like things do ye. Take it from Mark 7, 1 through 13. Now, before we go here, let's go over to the book of Matthew. And what we want to do is look at the understanding here that the Lord has given unto us uh, in his writing and the things that the Lord would have us to do. Now, Matthew 6, what we want to do, brethren, is continue to study the word, study the word, look at the word of God. That way, when someone speaks to you, you know that isn't in the word of God. Matthew 6, Jesus is going to show he wants you and I to pray for God to give us his word every day. Now, let's watch this. Matthew 6, and now look at this. Verse number 5. Now, let's go to verse 4. He's going to criticize what men do and show what we should do. That thine eyes may be in secret, and our Father may see it in secret. Himself shall reward the open. So his theme is whether you're giving or doing, do it secret. And thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue in the corner of the street, that they may be seen of men. Truly I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret, and thy father, which see it in secret, shall open, they reward thee. When you pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do. But they think that they will be heard for their must speak. And we used to do this in the Catholic Church. Holy Mary, Mother God, pray for us at our death. Amen. You say that so many times. You know, my goodness. Said the Our Father so many times. That's what repetition over and over. Not as Jesus asked three times, but just repeating over and over. He said for the must speaking, they think we're heard. That's what we thought. Keep on saying it. Heal, heal. That's what they teach. Be you not there for a lack of them. For your father know what things you have need of before you have. Now watch this. Now watch what he says. After this man therefore pray ye. Our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Now you stop there and if you just hold a minute and say, he's talking about food to eat. Let's just keep reading. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debt to us. And he does not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now you already said your father already knows what you have need of. So why pray at all? Well, that's something you need to pray for regularly that you need the Lord to give you. A blessing and that you do not be led into temptation. Do you know you have to ask God for that? This is a prayer talk about Jesus. You have to worry about the part of the kingdom coming. We know that's came. That doesn't make the whole other prayer void and disannul. Like it's not important. You have to pray to God that I am not led into temptation. Don't lead us into temptation. He says what you need to ask the Lord. Deliver us from evil. He also said give us this day our daily bread. Now let's prove this isn't real bread. Let's go down, if you will, to a few more verses. It's a famous verse here we use a lot. And we want to show that he's not telling you ask for food in the previous prayer. Look at verse 24. No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man mind. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What you shall eat. So why would you ask the Lord that please give us food? He just said don't take no thought. Don't, don't worry about that. But he is going to tell you what you should worry about. Or what you should drink. Not yet for your body. What you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. He goes in explanation of who the Lord feeds. Behold the Father and the for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much more than they? Okay. Now watch what happens. Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit into his stature? No one. So it says, why are you worried about the physical? What is this thing? Why are you worried about the physical? So why would he tell you in a previous prayer, make sure y'all pray for food, for bread? No. 
This is how we know. Here's the part we're proving, brother. Now let's go down a little bit further. Look at verse 31. Take no thought, saying, well, we shall eat. So why would you tell me to pray for us? We're proving a point here. Well, we shall drink, or with all shall we be cold. For all these things do the Gentiles see. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all things. What do you pray for? Watch, he's going to show the spiritual things. What do you seek? The spiritual thing. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Take that for no thought for tomorrow. For tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Why do I stress that? Because, brethren, I want to encourage you, please, study your Bible every day. How much? Your call. That's your call. Because you're supposed to be asking him for that feeding every day. And don't lead me into temptation. So, why would you not study every day? And why would you not be aware of the things that tempt you so that you can avoid them? Here's what you're asking. The Lord knows I'm going to feed everybody. That's what he says. I'm going to feed all of you. But I'm only going to save my children. That's what you and I must seek. He didn't say, but seek you first, the food and the job. Seek you first, continually, his word, his righteousness, his kingdom. That's what you and I have to do. So always focus on this very beautiful prayer that he gave us. To help our minds know we should be yearning to consume something about the Lord every day. I want to commend you all for the great work you're doing. Sending out encouraging texts, uh, prayer requests, or whatever you do. Focusing all our minds at some point of the day. Some of us might not answer until 12 at night. Don't worry about that. We got it. Because it may have been in a position where you couldn't get to your phone to answer any message. But know this. It's gotten, received, and loved, and appreciated. Because... Our minds have to be constantly focused on what prevents us from going into temptation and consuming that which brings us to the righteousness of the Lord. So we seek Him. That's an encouragement I want to give you because sometimes people can kind of make a big deal out of studying. Like it's not necessary. It's not important. It is critical. We're told to pray. That's what I want to emphasize. He wouldn't have told us, seek those things if they're not real. They are real. The righteousness is what we see. He says, I give the Gentiles those things. They're not asking him for the daily word. They're worshiping Molech, Asterisk. So he's saying, why would you need to be pressing me about food when you know to seek me, my word, spiritually, the righteousness of me, the kingdom about me, and take no thought for those other things. So that's an encouragement. We know we got to work. We know we got to prepare food. You got to just wake up one morning and say, I hope it's chicken. And now, no, we know that. But the key, brethren, is we want to have our minds focused on spirit. I'm not telling you how much to read. I'm not telling you how to read chapters on chapters and, and not go to work. I understand. I'm saying have a certain amount, whether it changes daily, of a verse or verses to keep your mind on the word of God because you are the children of God. And you're going to do something with it. It's just like the denominational world sending things about how you're going to overcome climbing the mountain. Really basically talking about making money and getting rich and getting things. And they know that's what they're talking about. But that thing's coming in. But we're talking about spiritual endowment where you're empowered spiritually. That's what we want to encourage you to do. Because if you don't, you're going to get caught up and such like things these people did. And you're going to fall. It's guaranteed. Mark 7 verse 1. Let's prove it. Now look. They're going to honor him with their lips. But the heart is nowhere near. Because they're looking at it. From a carnal point of repetition speaking. Or simply we go to the temple. We bow. Or we go to church. We pray. Brother sing some song. Take some crackers and juice. Hear a message. Some say amen. Some fall asleep. Whatever. And we go home. No it's more to it. And I know everybody can get sleepy. I'm not beating nobody up on that. I'm just saying make sure that we understand to absorb the spirituality of the case. Mark 7 and 1. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with defile, that is to say unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews except they washed their hands oft eat not, holding the tradition of the elder. And they came from the market except they washed, they eat not. And many other things there be which 
they have received to hold as a washing of cups, pots, brazen bells, and tables. It grew. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Notice the Pharisees, as powerful as they were, the creation of a court pattern after the Mars Hill Areopagite group of Greeks, the Sanhedrin that they have developed in a court system where they surround this uh, person with questions, just many different questions, grueling, grilling, and inspecting them, they still respected the elders. They said, well, we follow rules too. So they asked him, why aren't your disciples doing that? He asked and said unto him, well, hath Isaiah's or Isaiah's prophesied of you hypocrites. I said, these are pretenders, as it is written. This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. This is what we're trying to get away from, brethren. Uh, we want to get spiritual. Howbeit in vain they do worship me, teaching, watch this, for doctrines, the commandments of men. What does he mean? I thought doctrine was teaching. No. See, this is the importance of looking at another word. So let's look this up. He says, you're teaching for doctrines. Notice, with an S, the commandments of men. What is this word? Doctrines. G-1319. G-1319. He says, you're teaching for instruction, function, or information, doctrine, learning, teach. You're teaching an instruction from a man. That's what you're doing. That's the tradition of the elders. It's not came from a man. Verse 8. For laying aside the commandment of God. Now here comes a real commandment. You hold the tradition of men. As a washing of pots and cups and many other such like things you do. What does he mean by that? You're so engrossed in the tradition of the elders. You have lost focus on what God said to do. Let's prove it. Verse number 9. He said until full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. Why is that? Okay, here we go. We're a group of Pharisees, church leaders, elders, deacons, evangelists, Bible teachers, faithful members, following, supporting men and women. So we cook up this plan and this plan we cook up, it's important to us to carry out. But because of that, if there is a commandment from God that interferes with another plan we got, we slice that and we keep our tradition. Now watch him prove it. Verse 10. For Moses said, honor thy father and thy mother. And who so cursed father and mother, let him die to death. Two errors. Honor, that honor will end when father and mother die, which don't mean you talk about them. But there's no one to honor because they're dead. And also if you curse them, Died the death. That would be damnation. But you say if a man shall say to his father and mother, it is Corban. Okay, what is that? Corban, I think pretty pretty basic. A lot of us may know this, but let's just look it up anyway. Corban. All right. Put that up. Here it is. G2878. G2878. This is of Hebrew and Chaldee Orion respectively. A votive offering and the offering. A consecrated present to the temple fund. By extension, the latter term of treasure itself, that is the room where the co contribution box is stood, Corban treasury. So, they're telling them, if you say it is Corban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest profit to by me, I'm free. So, you know, if I tell my parents that, you know, this is a gift, you know, I'm giving you. You know, so I, I'm going to take this and not feel obligated to do this to you. I'm free. Because I'm utilizing it, you know, on the fact is that I have obligation also to do other things with my money. One of them will be obviously to do stuff for the church. But the law does not want you to do things for the church and not honor your father and mother. So you have certain obligations to serve your father and mother by. So it didn't say father and mother say father and mother period. He says, and you suffer him no more to do 
Ah, that's anything for us father, us mother. Making the word of God another fact through your own tradition, which you have delivered, and many such like things do ye. So there's other things you do which make none of all the commandment. So I don't have to obligate to the parents. You would think, now you would stop for a minute, let me look at this for a minute and say, why would somebody do that? Because you're interfering with what I want to do with my traditions that I have about supporting church work and doing things where I can have access to your services. You stuck hanging around your mom and dad and doing things. I got something we need to do at the church. So break loose from that. You're free. Nobody care about Moses said. We got our thing going over here. He said, this is a problem. He says, you fool well, you reject this commandment so you can make your tradition suffice with the things in need. This is what he said. They have a purpose in this. This isn't just be mean to mom and daddy life. It is, you got to do some stuff for us. We need some things. So the Lord has never wanted you to do things in service to the Lord where you make null and void another commandment that he said do. That's ridiculous. So this is what they thought. Okay, this is what the lesson is about. People do these types of things, brethren. Let's look at some facts. Where there is no law, there is no sin. Let's prove this. Romans chapter 4. There is no law in these people's mind that they can pull up in the Bible that says you must wash your hands in a consecrated manner after coming from the market where there are all manner of people coming, sinners and other people, in order that you might be Considered holy of God. There's nothing like that. So we say, well, brother Jose, and they just tried. Or we might say, brother Peter, they just trying to, you know, keep things in order and keeping the young people in mind on spiritual health. That's not how it's done. Romans 4 and 14. Because he says, the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Wow. Pretty simple. Look at 1 John 3 and 4. 1 John, the epistle 3 and 4. Let's see what we got here. 1 John 3 and 4. Systematic teaching by God. Whosoever committed sin transgressed also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. So therefore there must be a law there in order for you to violate. And sin will then therefore be the transgression of the law. The law will determine what is sin. Look at another point. The law must not be broken to keep a tradition. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. And this is exactly what they did. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. He says, And this voice, oh, hang on, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corrupt things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your Fathers, that didn't save you. So why would you follow tradition of the fathers? Galatians 1, 13 through 14. Let's go to that one. Galatians 1, 13 through 14. All right, let's get this. For you have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jewish religion. Paul says, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion, above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the tradition of my fathers. So now the Jewish society has become a group of false doctrine teachers, Paul being one of them. No one's following the law of Moses in this area anymore. So Paul recognized I was zealous of the tradition of my fathers more exceedingly than the others. So the traditions of his father, he had to realize those teachings, his father, the literal father, and others before him, you can't do it anymore, Paul. So he realizes that. And that's why Peter says, you're not going to be saved with these traditions. And this is to the Jewish nation. Let's look at another one. Second Thessalonians 2 and 15. So what traditions do we follow? These that we're fixing to read. Second Thessalonians 2 and 15. Therefore, brethren... Stand fast and hold the traditions 
which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistles or not. That's what we keep. Not of our fathers, Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, but the tradition of the apostles, the writers of the New Testament. That's what we stand in. Look at another thought. It is a sin to teach a doctrine of man for a law of God. Look at Deuteronomy 14. Deuteronomy 14. Jesus tore them up with this nonsense they were doing. If you don't think it was important for him to address his issue, then you're not understanding what Jesus' mission was to set things straight, to set things in order, that we might be saved. Deuteronomy 4 and 10. Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in horror, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. That's the motive. 2 Samuel 23 and 1. Let's see what Samuel has to say. The book of Samuel. 2 Samuel 23 and 1. So Moses told him, you know, you know these are words I gave you. And the Lord told me to gather you so you will know what he wants you to do. 2 Samuel 23 and verse 1. Now, these be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, Now look at what David said a leader should do. And the man who was raised up on high, the anointing of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, The Spirit of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spake to me. He that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. That's how you lead. What is the fear of God? To do the words of that God has said to do. That's the fear of God. Look at Isaiah 29 and verse 13. Isaiah 29, 13. Systematic teaching by God. The system is flawless. Let's continue to read his word. Isaiah 29 and 13. Well, for the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near with their mouth, remember Jesus quoted this, and with their lips, do all of me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Do you see the unhappy report that this is brought forth? The law says they're trying to teach fear about me from the precept of a man. Something he said. He said, You can't do that. So teaching hand washing and any other such like nonsense is that coming from a man. He said, that's not going to teach people to fear me. That's why the Pharisees don't fear him. That's why they didn't listen to Jesus. Because they were teaching a bunch of nonsense. And then when it comes to real commandments, like Moses said, they pushed that out the way that they may pull forth a brand new tradition. That's replaced Moses' whole tradition with one of our traditions, which is ridiculous to do at this time frame. Let's look at another part. There is no sin in eating with dirty hands, pots, etc. Look at Mark 7 and 30. Jesus is not only going to discredit it, he's going to tell why it doesn't even make any type of spiritual sense. He dismantles it because it is so powerful. You know, when you have the Pharisees pushing something, it has to really be powerful. Mark 7 and verse number 30. He says here, And when... She was come to her house. She found a devil gone out. Her daughter laid upon the bed. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Hang on, let's go back up. Let's go back up. Mark chapter 7. I said 30, forgive me. Let's go to verse 20. That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. Notice what comes out. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetous, wickedness, deceit, deceiviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile the man. He says, why does it not hurt to eat with dirty fingers? Look at verse 18. Are you so without understanding also do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from Without entering into the man, it cannot defile him, but because it entered not into his heart, but into the belly. 
and go out in the drought, purging all meat. And use the restroom, it's out. Now watch this. Here's where we have to help people understand about wine, liquor. When you drink wine and you don't get drunk, it's not the wine that goes in your heart to your, to your spirit and inner man and through your pores and ow, and demons come out. It's what comes out of your mouth after you drink or how you think while you're drunk because you're not sober. So you start to think and be angry. That's what Job was afraid of. He said they may have cursed God in their heart. They were going to make a sacrifice for my children because they had a party because it was birthday time. And that's what he did. He was a great man. And we have to pray for our children too because you don't know what goes in their heart. So that's okay. Don't get drunk. So when someone says that if the liquor just touch your mouth, you see, it's ridiculous because he hasn't gotten drunk yet. What does that say? Are we promoting drinking? No, we're not. We're pointing out a fact. You cannot get defiled by something that goes in your mouth. If you are deceived by it, you drink too much, now it gets into your spirit. Why? Because now I can't control it. Because there's a link between the drinking and you being able to control your thoughts and your spirit. We said earlier today about the kid that slapped another kid for disrespecting God, saying he doesn't exist. And we point out that we don't condone violence. We know that. And we know that that kid, I won't tell you who he is, but it's from a Christian family. And I'm sure, knowing his mother, that she reprimanded him for striking that kid. So the idea is that, what I'm pointing out to you is that Still, though, it was amazing how no one said anything. I think everybody's shocked. Nobody's seen anything like that. But we know God told us we don't hit to make nobody understand the word of God. Yeah, there was a time when people were getting knocked upside the head. That's why I mentioned Nehemiah. That's a time. Knocked upside the head, hair yanked out and everything. But now we've turned those weapons into plows and we plow the heart. So the kid has to understand big talk. Okay, you can't help that little kid by hitting it. But the idea is that in a day... In time where people get bananas over religious thoughts, it was amazing how everyone froze. They froze for a moment because it's like, whoa, what was this? So you don't know, is this of God? Uh, did God want this? So I don't know what was in people's mind, but it, all we know is that everybody froze and no one spoke. Because they don't know. Was the Lord that wanted this help? We don't know. But we do know the law does not promote violence. They're not going to hit people because they don't understand. No, they're not because you don't want nobody hitting you. You just don't want to hit nobody because they don't understand the Bible. But let us remember something, brethren, is that we have to remember is that wickedness is what comes out. So let's remember the wickedness. That's what defines not dirty fingers or not the tradition or men. Any other tradition you create, it will not be able to prove that this is where wickedness comes from. So we got a few things we'll put in. We'll wrap it up. Because as many other such like things. If we find ourselves doing God will punish us. Therefore no law was needed on washing hands. Now the priest washed their hands before a certain procedure. They had a laver. Which is like a basin. Where they washed their hands. It was very expensive. It was so expensive. The men began to cut on it and take pieces of it to Go and get other nations to help them fight. Man, that stuff was expensive. Nevertheless, let us remember something. Is that that was for a ceremony. That's not a law for you. That was for the priest told to do certain things. Bake bread and have it laid out. 12, 12 pieces. And don't eat until a certain time. We don't do that. So that was a law that Moses did tell them they had to do. And Aaron and them carried out. But not this type of law. Let's look at one final thought. There is no sin in marrying again after divorce if you cannot be reconciled with your spouse. Also, if you cannot refrain from sex. Let us validate that. 1 Corinthians 7. You see how easy this is? So you can switch this, brother, to any old fake law men come up with. Women shouldn't wear pants to church. All kind of nonsense. You know, and I'm just like, man, a woman in a dress is just as attractive as pants. That's such a ridiculous thing. I'll tell you, this is what men do. 1 Corinthians 7 and verse number 8. Let's read that. I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. How is Paul when he writes this? Not married. But if you cannot contain, if they cannot contain, 
Let them marry. Let them marry. I say it one more time. Number of completion three. Let them marry. Who can speak against this? For it's better to marry than to burn. Look up the word burn. Passion. Paul says this. Look, let them marry. Because he already knows he's fixing to explain why would that be necessary. Verse 10. And until the marry, I command yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. But if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And not the husband put away his wife. Paul cannot come up and say, don't put away your wife and violate what the Lord has allowed men to do already. Paul is speaking of, don't get divorced, period. And that's what he says. There's another area that says, what will prompt divorce? He's going to talk about it in a few more verses. He's going to say, well, this is some of the things that will promote divorce. Watch him speak. But to the rest be God, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And a woman which hath a husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else where your children are clean, but now they hold it. But if the unbelieving depart, what does Paul say? Let him depart. A brother or sister, not on the bond in such cases, God had caught us to peace. But what knowest thou a wife? What thou shalt say to her husband? If you want to say, you don't know that. Or what knowest thou a man? What thou shalt say to her wife? But as God had distributed to every man, as the Lord had called to everyone, so let him walk, and so ordained I in all the churches. All churches. Every church of Christ needs to be quiet and teach this. This is readable doctrine. And we're going to stand on this because we want to go to heaven. So he has covered all the aspects of this portion of his discussion on marriage. Starting off with, let them marry. Just because he talked about this first and then talked about don't get married would be no different if we talk about don't get divorced, should I say, and then later say, let them marry. It's in the same context. It's in the same chapter. It's in the same book. It's to the same people. And we're reading. This is ridiculous. And brethren, this is what you need to be aware of. We could talk about so many things, and we not. Because you have the template, which is, where's the law? Well, there is no law, there is no sin. Sin is a transgression of the law. With no law that you cannot possibly sin. There is no law against you marrying and providing they don't want you back. That's the key, he said. They don't want you back. And you burn with passion. You've been divorced. He addresses you with the word unmarried, verses 7 and 8. See, this is what's wrong with us. What happened to the Pharisees? We're going to go beyond what's written. God don't know what he's doing. Man, you got to stay on these things. Wash hands. Let's make up some money. Oh, doing the father and mother? No, nah, that's Corban. That's the gift. See, your mind starts to gravitate to implant your tradition instead of the commandment. If the Lord thought you marrying again would be the bounds for him to put you in. He wouldn't have never made an option. It wouldn't have been nobody writing. It would have been you're going to hell. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. He put it out because he knows, I made you. I know how you function best. Once you get your life right, seek me first. I'll add the wife to you. They're like I add the bread and everything else. You need to go to church, get your life right. Get your mind set on sanctity, and then maybe at that point, the Lord will add a husband or a wife to your life. Because a prudent wife comes from the law. We need to understand that. And so let's remember that, brother. We don't need to add nothing to the word of God. We don't need to make up nothing. Your concept of stay celibate violates Paul's instruction. So you're teaching for Doctrine, the commandment of you, the man, or some other crone like you, crony, old crone, or uh, some person think they've been in church so long that they can make up a law where there is no law from God. We need to remember that because a lot of lives have been shattered. People have left the church. And somebody's going to talk to the Lord at the judgment, having their hand involved with this nonsense teaching. What we need to do is remember something. Teach people to love one another. That's how you stay married. Love, L-O-V-E. Because when you love people, you put up with a lot of foolishness and help them get themselves right. You'll never explain to me how Solomon and the Shulamite can love each other. You don't, you, don't have a, you don't have a thought you can tell me past the Bible. L-O-V-E 
is like death. He never give up. She couldn't let him go, and he can't let her go. And all the other women he had meant nothing. But well, she said, tell him, come, I want to see him. Oh, excuse me, Susie, I got to go. And she's number one. You have to understand that, brother. That's what love is. Who's number one? No, we're not in a time where we can have multiple husbands and wives. But so you should read it. It's really easy, baby, to understand who's number one now nah, and not step outside your relationship. That should be a no-brainer. But after that, it's still going to be based off love. We can swell our jaws up and shoot our lips and poke out our eyes all day. The Lord said, love's like death and jealousy is like the grave. They don't let go. Nobody going to share you with nobody. You better be careful you get yourself hurt fooling around with other people. God bless you. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15 and close out our session with the gospel of Jesus Christ. People running around here. And we got a lot of trouble like this in pulpits, too. These old weak need lousy preachers also don't know how to stay with one woman either. That's why you're getting divorced and getting ran down the street because you don't know how to teach. And then you don't know how to live it because you don't know how to teach it. First Corinthians 15 and verse number two. You thought you was going to stay celibate and you're teaching false doctrine. How can you? For I deliver unto you first of all that which also I received. How Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. And that he was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scripture. Mark 16, verse number 15. We should go preach this. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Look at Acts 2, 36. What does the text tell us? Therefore let all the house of Israel know assured that God had made that same day. Man, I love this verse so much. Showing there's somebody other than Jesus that makes him something. Lord Jesus, praise the name of the Father. Lord and Christ, made him both Lord and Christ. Wow, made him, made, made, made him. That same Jesus. Verse 37. And when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter, to rest with men, brother, what shall we do? Then Peter said, to repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of sin, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that our Father, even as many of the Lord our God shall come. Men of the words, he testified his heart, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Oh, crooked generation, homosexuals, wife beaters, thieves, murderers, killing babies, crooked politicians, whole nation tore from the floor, and it's spilt into the church now. Now we got to deal with it. Verse 41. Then they that glad received the word of baptized, saying that they were after them about 3,000 souls. They continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. Acts 2 47. Praising God, have favor to all people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 35. Then Philip opened his mouth, began to say scripture, and preached unto him Jesus, not Moses, not Muhammad. As they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and Eunice said, See, here's water. What did hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believe with all thine heart, thou mayest. And the answer said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He commanded the child to stand still. They went down both to the water by Philip and the uni, and he baptized him. He didn't say, I believe that Jesus is the Father. He didn't say, I believe that Jesus is the Holy Ghost. He said, the Son of God, boy, this is so easy. God help us. Now the rejoicing began. Praise the Lord God Almighty. I'm so happy. I don't know what to do. First verse in 12, 13. I could literally die right now. I don't hope it happened, but I could. But by one spirit, we're all baptized in the one body. What's the one body? The church. Colossians 1, 18. Will it be Jews or Gentiles? Will it be bond or friend? Have all been made to drink into one spirit? Did you see us read the text where it says church of God? So if you call yourself the church of God, you better make sure you're the church of God. You better make sure you don't have no entry. We better not see no women preaching. You better be worshiping on Sunday. You better be teaching the truth about the doctrine. Because church of God is in the Bible. But if we see you doing something different, if it says church of Christ, we even know you're not our brethren. You're not. You ever wonder why somebody just can't read from the Bible and believe it? Same reason a white man may not like a black man. 
And a Mexican may not like an Asian because there's hatred in the heart for the father. Just like there's hatred brother to brother, both coming from Adam and Eve. There's always going to be hatred in this filthy, vile place. Make sure you don't hate the Lord. Make sure you do what he says, brother, and follow the pattern of the Bible. Obey it to your last breath. And God will be so glad to see you when you walk before him. To go before the maker and not get burnt up and destroyed means you have to be his. He says, for by one spirit are we baptized and in one body will be Jews or Gentiles. will be born and free and have all been made to drink into one spirit. Praise God Almighty. When it saved me, preacher, you better believe it. 1 Peter 3, 21, the light figure where to even baptism does also now save us. That's so sweet. Reminds me every time I have hope I'm not going to hell. And these should you because I was baptized into Christ Jesus. Not the putting away of the, filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is going into heaven on the right hand of God. Angels, authorities, and powers be made southern unto him. On the right hand of who? God, the same one that made him Lord and Christ. Praise the Lord. Revelation 2.10. We don't have no problem with God the Father being number one. Neither do Jesus or the Holy Ghost. Revelation 2.10. There are none of those things but thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some in the prison. That you may be tried. Satan's coming. You shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful in the death. I will give thee a crown of life. God bless you. May the word of the Lord permeate into your heart. Penetrate. Make sure you be one with the Father. If you listen to the message, I'll lift V-shaped object to the right. Touch it under the title. Or tap that screen, either one. And you'll see phone numbers pop up. Brother Fritz and number there are others. Brother Robin. Call them. About to kill your baby. Stop. Don't get that abortion. Don't be a murderer. Don't let your grandma talk into it. You're about to kill yourself. Stop. Don't let nobody tell you to do it. Don't kill nobody else either while you're at it. If you got a problem with your spouse, walk out the house and leave. Run if you have to. Don't hurt nobody. Start your life over somewhere else. If you kill somebody, everybody going to come looking for you. You got to understand what we're doing here. Before you make a rash move, call those numbers. Talk to the righteous before it's too late. If you need to be baptized, call the number. If you here need to be baptized, stay standing. Hold your hand up. If you need prayer, you can do the same. Just remember, God loves you. It's his eyes to save you. It's not a joke. It's not folklore. There's no nonsense involved. It will be called the cup, as you'll see in Acts. It's called the cup then. It's called the cup today. Because it's the only one true church that exists. And you have to be a part of it. Stay faithful, brethren. Trust God always. And he will lift you up. Because we're going to die. But let me tell you something. You trust the Lord. David said you won't be afraid when you walk through the valley. He said because the rod and staff will be with you. Come now together. We stand singing. Have his invitation. Oh, why will you linger? Good job.